Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we do analysis in Rn. And in today's part 25, we will finally talk about the so-called implicit function theorem. However, before we start with all that, you already know, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, as a supporter, you can download the PDF version of this video, which is very helpful to follow the proof. Now, from the last video, we already know that we can use local diffeomorphisms to rewrite implicit equations. For example, we have discussed if we can solve this equation for the variable z. Which simply means, can we rewrite one part of the sphere as a graph surface? If that works, we can say that this equation here has implicitly a function z of x, y given. So exactly this is what the implicit function theorem does for us. Therefore, let's reformulate the problem in full generality. The whole equation should be defined on a domain in Rn and let's call it u. And there we should already split everything up namely we want to split it into two parts. So we have the first k variables and the last m variables. So in the example before, rk was given by x and y and rm was simply given by z. Okay, now let's assume that our domain u here is open and that we have a c1 function on it. And this one we simply call capital F. And now since we want to have a local inverse in the end, the codomain has to be rm as well. Again, in the example before, m was equal to 1, but we can easily generalize that. So these are the underlying assumptions of the theorem, and you see this function f just represents such an equation. This means we will also fix a given value for the function f. However, let's first fix the point where we want to have our local behavior around. And let's call this one u0, where we use superscripts to avoid confusion. So this is an element in Rn, which means we can split it up into the two components. So first we have x0 with k entries, and second we have y0 with m components. Now this is very important to remember, we put all these variables here into our x0, and z is just given by y0. So this is our element in u and it should satisfy the equation given by f. Therefore, in general, we would just say if we put it into f, we get out 0. Hence, the special function value we fix is just the 0 vector in Rm. Therefore, you could say we have m equations of this form, but we put all the constants to the left as well. And now it's always easy to visualize the whole thing in two dimensions because there we just have a contour line. So all points on this line here are sent to 0 if we put them into f. Therefore, for example, here we could have our u0, which also means x0 is here and y0 there. And now our good analysis knowledge tells us that for a c1 function, locally we can do a linearization. And we can describe this with the Jacobian matrix. So let's look at the Jacobian at the point u0. It's an n times n matrix, but we can also split it up. This means first we can look at the k variables with x. Hence our first column here is simply df dx1. And then we have more columns until we reach the kth one, which is the partial derivative of f with respect to xk. And then in the next column, obviously, we have xk plus 1, and then we continue until we reach the last one with xn. So this is the ordinary Jacobian with n partial derivatives in it. However, since we have already renamed the variables to distinguish the two parts in u, we should also rename the partial derivatives. This means xk plus 1 should be simply y1. And the last column then should be ym. Indeed, if we write it like that, we see that the Jacobian matrix consists of two matrices inside. Moreover, the right hand side here is a nice square matrix. In fact, it's an m times m matrix. 
And here it's useful to introduce a short name for that. Let's write df dy. So we write a partial derivative symbol, but what we actually mean is a whole matrix. It makes sense because f is a vector valued function and y represents also m variables. Hence we can use a similar notation for the left hand side, but this is not a square matrix. Of course, in general, m is not equal to k. Okay, so this is how the general Jacobian looks like, but we should be more precise because we want to evaluate the partial derivatives at the point u0. Which means we should definitely put this into our notation as well. And there we get our df dx at u0 is an m times k matrix. So in summary, we read our Jacobian here as a block matrix. And with that we have all the assumptions. Now we can formulate our implicit function theorem. So maybe first to recall, what we actually want can be visualized in this picture. Locally, around our point here, we want to have a graph of a function. So this is a nice graph, but please recall, we just have a contour line, so it definitely could look like this as well. Which implies, at such a point here, we would not find a local graph. It's easy to see, because it goes back and forth, this cannot be a graph of a function where x is the variable and y is the value. Which means, in our theorem here, we have to exclude such points. And since the gradient is always perpendicular to the contour line, we can describe it with it. Indeed, this gradient here would not have a component in the y direction. So this is exactly what we want to exclude, which means the whole problem is hidden in the y variables in the Jacobian. So in general, I can already tell you what we want. We want that this matrix here is invertible. And there you see, in the case that m is equal to 1, it means that the partial derivative with respect to y is non-zero. However, in general we have a whole matrix, hence there we have to say that the determinant of this matrix is not zero. And then we have excluded this problematic case and we can describe our local graph. And as always we do that with open sets, so let's say we have v1 in rk and v2 in rm. And now obviously our points x0 and y0 should lie inside. So you could say we found open neighborhoods for these two points. And moreover we find a map g from v1 to v2. More precisely it's also a c1 function. And the graph of this function is the one we are interested in. So again let's simply take our two-dimensional picture here. And please don't forget, in general, the x-axis describes k variables and the y-axis describes m variables. Hence, the graph we are interested in is a subset in Rn. And now we know everything works locally, so we have our set v1 here and the set v2 there. And then, as we have said before, the graph of the function g we find here. So even in higher dimensions, we could say this is the graph of G. So the claim is, it's exactly the generalized contour line in this area. And you know exactly this, we have to put into a mathematical formula. This is not so complicated, we simply take our function f, and then we just take our first k variables, we just call x, and then the m y variables are represented by g of x. And then you see, what we want to get out here is always 0. 0 was the value we have chosen for f, and please don't forget, it's the 0 vector in Rm. So in other words, we actually have m equations in 1. And now the claim is that all of them are satisfied for all x in v1. And this is the implicit function theorem. Under this assumption, the existence of g is guaranteed. And moreover, we can also say something about the derivative of g. Indeed, it should be the derivative in the general sense, so we talk about the Jacobian. But before we do that, we should clarify again what we have here. If we take two points x and y, x from v1 and y from v2, such that they lie on the generalized contour line, which simply means 
f of x and y is equal to 0, then we already have that y is equal to g of x. Hence, this means that v1 and v2 are chosen small enough. So visually, we see that no other parts of the contour line lie in this rectangle. So in short, we have that if we choose v1 and v2 small enough. And now as promised, for the derivative of g, we have the following formula. And in fact, this one is really helpful for calculations and important to remember. So we can calculate the Jacobian at the point x0, and indeed even for a neighborhood around x0, and we get minus two Jacobians multiplied. And the first matrix we have here is the Jacobian with respect to y. And we have to evaluate it at the point x, g of x. Hence, at the point x0, this should be just our u0. And there we know by assumption, the inverse exists. And since it's a continuous function, we know it also exists in a neighborhood around it. And then finally, we multiply it with the second Jacobian. This one we denoted by df dx, and it's evaluated at the same point. And we have this formula for a small neighborhood around x0, and this one we call v1. So in summary, the implicit function theorem tells us about the existence of two open sets v1 and v2, and about the existence of a function g such that all of this holds. And this is why it is such an important theorem, because it justifies that we can always work with such an implicit function g. Maybe we still don't know how the expression of g looks like, but we know it exists and we can calculate with it. Indeed, we will see more examples later, but first I would say, let's prove this nice theorem. This will take a little bit more time, so I would say, let's do that with the next video. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.